everyone. I think most of you know who I am, but I'm Nicole Sampson, uh, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and also faculty member in uh, chemistry. So thank you for joining us for today's inaugural lecture of the Ojima Distinguished Lectureship Award in Chemistry. I want to express and thank, um, express my gratitude, excuse me, and thank Dr. Iwao Ojima and his wife Yoko for their philanthropic investment to establish an endowed lectureship which ensures that Emma, sorry, the lights appear very difficult. Let me start again. Um, which ensures that eminent chemistry scholars from around the world will continue to enrich us in the years to come. Today, thanks to the extraordinary generosity of the Ojimas, we will have the privilege of hearing our first Ojima Award recipient, Dr. Makoto Fujita, distinguished professor from the University of Tokyo. Professor Ojima's devotion to innovative research and advancing the discipline of chemistry has long been evident in all the years I have known him as a scientist, mentor, and trusted colleague since I joined the Department of Chemistry in 1993. At that time, Iwao gave me very good advice that I still remember. It was a time of federal grant funding scarcity and single digit pay lines. He told me, it doesn't matter. You have to put your best science forward, have more than one grant, and always be your own insurance policy. Then you will always be able to pursue the science that you want to do, and Iwao led by example. This advice and much additional advice along the way have helped me in my career, and I thank him for that. Iwao began his career first at the University of Tokyo, and then the Sagami Institute of Chemical Research in Japan, before he joined the Department of Chemistry at Stony Brook in 1983. In 1995, he was honored with the designation of Distinguished Professor by the State University of New York. At Stony Brook, Professor Ojima has served as department chair, the founding director for the Institute of Chemical Biology and Drug Discovery since 2003, and as president of the Stony Brook chapter of the National Academy of Inventors since 2016. He holds more than 100 U.S. and foreign patents and has published over 500 papers. Professor Ojima continues to be recognized worldwide for his many groundbreaking contributions to the chemical sciences, including national awards in four different subdisciplines from the American Chemical Society. I should note that 17% of the patents at Stony Brook are held by chemistry uh, department faculty members, and Iwao is one of the main innovators of this faculty. Two of his current NIH grants are in collaboration with faculty in biochemistry, microbiology, anesthesiology, the Cancer Center, as well as at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Through his leadership of the Institute of Chemical Biology and Drug Discovery, the Institute has built significant bridges between East and West Campus, the medicine side and the non-medicine side, bridges that anticipated President McInnes's vision for one university. So let me share with you a few highlights of Iwao's work and their impacts. Iwao started his career working in organometallic chemistry, specifically with phosphine rhodium complexes that allowed the development of new synthetic processes and had applications in asymmetric catalysis. In 1993, he, headed, he edited Catalytic Asymmetric Synthesis, which is now in its third edition. At the same time, he developed methods to specifically introduce fluorine into a variety of molecules with a large focus on amino acids and nucleotides. Fluorinated compounds are particularly useful in synthesizing medically useful compounds, which resulted in Iwao editing the book Fluorine in Medicinal Chemistry and Chemical Biology. His processes were used in commercial synthesis of an antiviral drug. In addition, he developed the beta-lactam synthon method, which is used in amino acid, peptide, and taxane taxol synthesis. The method is used commercially for the introduction of the side chain on paclitaxel, brand name Taxol, and his current work is focused on tumor-targeted drug delivery, antibacterial agents, antifungal agents, and anti-nociceptive pain agents. His taxoid work has led to an anti-cancer compound that is in late phase clinical trials and which is effective against multi-drug resistant cancer cells as well as cancer stem cells. It's being developed by Targogenics, and this drug is anticipated to be in clinical use later this year or early next year. So congratulations, Awao, on seeing nearly 40 years of work reach this impactful and practical use. 
So once again, I thank you, Iwao and Yoko, for your kindness and for your vision in making today's lectureship possible and for bringing us all together today. This golden egg in particular is so thankful for all your support and contributions in so many ways over the last 30 years. I look forward to working with you for the next 30. Now I'd like to introduce Professor Peter Tong, Distinguished Professor of Chemistry and Department Chair, who will introduce today's inaugural Ojima Distinguished Lecturer. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Nicole. So I'm absolutely delighted to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Makoto Fujita, who is the inaugural recipient of the Ojima Distinguished Lecture Award in Chemistry. Um, as Nicole said, Dr. Fujita is a University Distinguished Professor in the Department of Applied Chemistry at the University of Tokyo and also holds a Distinguished Professorship in the Institute of Molecular Science. Dr. Fujita received his PhD in Engineering from the Tokyo Institute of Technology and then joined Chiba University as an Assistant Professor. He was promoted to Associate Professor and joined the Institute of Molecular Science before being appointed as a professor at the Graduate School of Engineering at Nagoya University. He then joined the School of Engineering at the University of Tokyo as a professor before being promoted to University Distinguished Professor. Dr. Fujita has made pioneering contributions to the development of self-assembling molecular systems based on coordination chemistry. He introduced the concept of metal-directed self-assembly to supramolecular um, chemistry, creating building blocks from transition metal groups and organic molecules that self-assemble into large, stable, cyclic, and three-dimensional structures. Applications of his work include the encapsulation of proteins in self-assembled coordination cages, for example, to control protein stability or modulate enzyme activity, and the development of porous crystalline sponges that bind and align small, molecule, small molecules, facilitating, for example, the determination of their structures. This is um, an incredibly hot area of research, and unsurprisingly, Dr. Fujita's seminal contributions have been recognized by numerous awards. For example, he received the Arthur C. Cope Scholar Award from the American Chemical Society, and more recently was named a, a Clarivate Citation Laureate based on the very high citation rate of his published work. He is also a recipient of the Wolf Prize in Chemistry um, which was for conceiving metal-directed assembly principles leading to large, highly porous complexes. He shared the Wolf Prize with Professor Omar Yagi, who is a previous distinguished lecturer at Stony Brook. Um, please join me in welcoming Professor Chip Fujita for his lecture, Coordination Self-Assembly from Origins to the Latest Advances. Thank you, Professor Tang, for the kind introduction. So uh, it's really my big pleasure and great honor to be here uh, as the first speaker of the uh, Ojima Distinguished Lectureship. So it's, I'm really honored. So the, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank, sincerely thank the Professor Ojima and uh, all the faculty members for selecting me as a, a first speaker of this uh, distinguished lectureship. Also, uh, I'm very happy to be back to this place. Okay? So, I'm a frequent visitor to Stony Brook, and my last visit was the, uh, 2015, on the occasion of the symposium celebrating Professor Ojima's 70th birthday. So, uh, we have a strong relationship uh, because of not simply due to we are both Japanese, but so we, we have a special connection, strong connection. So uh, 40 years ago, uh, I was one of the group members in Professor Ojima's group at the Sagami Research Institute. It's a private research institute. But uh, I spent only one year in his group and the next year, 1983, he moved to Stony Brook. But uh, uh, the one year uh, I spent with Professor Ojima was really, really 
impressive to me. And uh, actually, so this publication is my first, first authored paper. And uh, uh, this publication made me uh, very, very confident that uh, I could do uh, the uh, so academic researchers. So, in, so I could, I can continue. continue. So, and uh, uh, he made me very, very aggressive because all the members. So, it's not a big group, but all the members are very characteristic. Yes, <laughs> very aggressive. Okay, <laughs> so I was also <laughs> influenced, and uh, actually, so. One old picture tells you that we are discussing something, but discussing about chemistry, even at the bar, okay? And uh, we are very serious, okay? The <laughs> Professor Ojima is uh, a very good supervisor, and uh, for many, many years, he is a very good forever mentor, okay? And uh, we are a little bit serious, but uh, 40 years later, uh, we are now very good friends, okay? <laughs> because uh, uh, he's 70s, I'm 60s, all, almost the same. So, uh, through the many, many interactions, then uh, somewhat uh, serious situations becomes milder and milder, spontaneously getting so more stable, okay? So, this is the principle of Self-organization, so, <laughs> so, which is the topic of my lecture. Okay, so spontaneous organization is called self-organization. So let me uh, introduce the two important terms: so self-assembly and self-organization. Uh, physical people would like to strictly distinguish these two terms. Actually, uh, yes. So str strictly speaking, the two words have different meaning, but roughly the same. And the chemists would like to use the self-assembly. So uh, in my lecture, I would like to use the self-assembly. So uh, these terms broadly refer to the phenomenon of spontaneous order generation in all fields, such as space, economy, such uh, society and even the business. Okay, so everywhere, everywhere, so you have experienced self-assembly and self-organization. So we are doing the uh, self-assembly in at, at molecular level, and uh, in our self-assembly uh, studies, we are using transition metal by adding the metal to the solution of a very simple bridging organic components. Then the all the species try to find and spontaneously find their right pathway leading to the most stable structure. So in this case, this spherical framework is formed spontaneously and in a quantitative yield. So from this animation, you can understand the principle and the power of self-assembly. We have been active in this field since 1990. So uh, we reported the self-assembly of a palladium cornered square complex by combining the 90 degree coordination work and the 449 by pillaging. So in this work, uh, we experienced the self-assembly. We learned the self-assembly not from the literature, but through this experiment. Of course, even back to the 80s, we can find some uh, historical milestone works for coordination self-assembly. But uh, these earlier works just expressed only the frameworks, only the structure. In our self-assembly, we created not the framework, but also the cavity, which is an excellent platform for creating many, many new functions. So then, uh, starting from a square, uh, we have synthesized many two-dimensional and three-dimensional discrete frameworks with large cavities. And depending on the size and shape of the cavities, then we could 
uh, design and create new properties by accommodating small molecules in the cavities. So uh, we could develop both the chemistry of the framework and also the chemistry of space within our self-assembled framework. So we first reported this M6L4 cage, three-dimensional cage, in 1995. But uh, still, this cage is uh, one of the center players in our laboratory because the cavity shows their excellent binding properties. So uh, this complex is cationic and uh, water-soluble, but in water, it provides a highly efficient hydrophobic pocket and the small molecules are strongly bound to the cavity. Then uh, we were able to make the aggregate of small molecules to accelerate specific chemical reactions with unusual uh, selectivities and uh, efficiency. So uh, still uh, the case is working uh, in my group. So, uh, creating the new properties function through the uh, confinement of molecule in a cavity it can be described as the molecular confinement effects. And uh, time to time, our projects uh, so develop, developed uh, so along the three different directions. One direction is, yes, the molecular confinement effects. And uh, in this line, in this project, we are making the structures bigger and bigger, and are making the uh, number of components larger and larger. So I will show you the, our champion structure in this lecture. And uh, at the same time, we are translating the discrete framework into the infinite framework to develop the solution chemistry within a solid state. So I will discuss uh, all these uh, so. so let me first discuss about the solution chemistry in the solid state. Again, uh, back to the 90s, uh, we also developed, we also designed and synthesized the square grid sheet infinite complex. So uh, nowadays, uh, this type of complex, com uh, complex is called the metal organic frameworks, or MOFs. But uh, MOF was termed by Omar Yaki in 95. So uh, when we synthesized this complex, the field was totally quiet. Only Richard Robson was pioneering, pioneering the field. So we developed the two chemistries in parallel. This is chemistry, but this is solid state chemistry, so uh, totally different. But we noticed that the nature of the cavity should be the same. So what we uh, envisioned was the, uh, to translate the solution chemistry into the solid state chemistry through the cavity. So uh, this is our first uh, purpose for this project. Then, uh, 2002, we had a very interesting finding. So, uh, the pore of the uh, infinite porous complex contained a lot of solvents. And when the uh, porous crystal is dipped in another solvent, then the pore solvents were completely replaced. But the solvent exchange, gas exchange occurred in single crystal to single crystal fashion. So namely, even after the gas exchange, we could clearly see the exchanged solvent molecules uh, in the pore of the porous crystalline complex. Okay? Then uh, we applied uh, this phenomena for the observation of chemical reactions in the pores. Namely, when the uh, reagents, uh, uh, reagent is diffused into the crystals, then the reaction starts in the pores. And uh, we could observe the chemical reactions, not by NMR, but by X-ray crystallography. Sometimes 
we could see the pre-organization of the substrate. And uh, then, so by carefully controlling the temperature, we could also see the reaction intermediate. Then uh, finally, got a product. So we could visualize the solution chemistry. Yes, in some papers, we reported the uh, X-ray snapshot observation of should solution state reactions. So we enjoyed it very much. Then uh, uh, after all, uh, we had an idea, okay? So if we absorbed unknown compound, then we can determine, we can easily determine the structure of the unknown compound. Yes. Okay, I mean that we, we, we are thinking about the material science. We are trying to develop new functions, new properties, new material science. But finally, we found that we were developing the analytical chemistry. So then we reported the Christian sponge method in 2013. So uh, in this method, uh, here is the porous crystalline material which is self-assembled from metal and uh, simple organic ligand. And uh, uh, with into the pores, uh, the uh, target organic molecule, sample compounds, uh, analytes uh, com compound is absorbed into the crystal. Then you can just pick up, pick up the crystal and go to the diffractometer in the laboratory then you can see the molecule. You can see. The, so in addition to the original host framework, you can see just penetrated, just absorbed gas structure. So, and uh, uh, this is a crystalline sponge method, which makes possible to observe the X-ray structure of target compound without crystallization. So then uh, we reported uh, this new X-ray technique in 2013. Uh, so this is the principle of the sponge method. So to observe the X-ray scattering, we need the ordered array of target compounds. So otherwise, X-ray do not, does not diffract. And, uh, Everybody believed that crystallization is only the way to make the ordered array. But it's not true. If cavities are already ordered, or if the cavities are already crystallized, then by simply pouring the uh, target compound into the uh, pores, then we can make the ordered array of the target compound. So, uh, this is the principle of the crystalline sponge method. So uh, we can say it's uh, the post-crystallization within the crystal. So based on uh, this principle, we removed the uh, crystallization protocol for our single crystal X-ray studies. Now you don't need to suffer from the uh, nightmare of crystallization. So uh, this is a chemical structure of our standard crystalline sponge. Oh, sorry. So the ligand is a uh, triaging cord, a triangular ligand. And uh, it's complex with zinc iodide. So the framework is interpenetrated. And uh, this complex satisfied uh, many, many uh, so require, so requirement to be the crystalline sponge. The first, the cavity is not too large and too small, also too small. And also, the, due to the uh, interpenetrated structure, the cavity can expand when a big molecule comes in. And if the gas molecule is small, then the cavity will shrink, shrink. So induced with molecular recognition works. Uh, actually, so gas molecules swim into the pores. 
and the guest molecule try to find their most comfortable place. At the same time, the host framework can change its orientation and conformation to find their best positions to capture their coming guest molecule. So induced fit molecular recognition works and everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. So the guest molecules are ordered. They are not disordered. Then we could see, they clearly see the uh, absorbed gas molecule. So these are pharmaceutical molecules. And uh, we were able to analyze. Uh, actually, uh, these, all the compounds were supplied from the uh, pharmaceutical companies as their test samples. So they wanted to see their ability of our method to analyze their uh, drug small molecules. And uh, we analyzed so, all the compounds. So the pharmaceutical companies are so much excited to see these results. And uh, by X-ray crystallography, uh, we can determine the absolute structure, so right-handed or left-handed by observing the anomalous scattering from heavy atoms. But normally, uh, we need the chemical modification on the substrate. So we need to incorporate heavy atoms. Otherwise, we could not see the clear anomalous scattering. But uh, just please remember that our host framework contains the uh, uh, heavy atoms. So zinc iodide. So zinc and iodine atoms. So by observing the anomalous scattering from the host framework, we could uh, easily determine the uh, right-handed or left-handed structure. So uh, this is a good news for synthetic people uh, who are doing asymmetric synthesis. They often have problems in determining the absolute configuration of their compounds. So, and sometimes they have many, many successful results, but they couldn't publish because they don't know so if the compound is right-handed or left-handed. So uh, this molecule has the actual chirality, the planar chirality, allen chirality, and these compounds have uh, chiral qu quaternary carbons. For these compounds, there are no empirical rules. So then the researchers have had problems. We analyzed and we determined the absolute configurations of all the compounds. And we are very happy to publish many uh, so collaboration papers. And the crystal sponge method, uh, there is another big advantage. We had a very big bonus. So uh, we can reduce the uh, amount of the analyte. Because uh, we can do the, on, the experiment only with one tiny crystal that weighs less than one microgram. And uh, we can pack the gas molecules uh, only in uh, nano to microgram quantities. We cannot pack any more in the pores. Uh, actually, so a tiny crystal is placed at the bottom of a microtube, which is dipped in a guest solution containing uh, so sub-microgram quantity of analytes. But uh, we were uh, still able to obtain the uh, X-ray structure of the absorbed guest compound. So the guest compound is a guaiatrin, so the amount is less than one microgram. Now we could clearly see the absorbed molecule. And they, uh, we calculated the volume, and uh, we calculated the uh, uh, so volume of the crystals, and uh, we realized that 500 nanogram is too much. So let's try smaller scale. Try smaller scale. I asked my students several times, and finally, uh, even with 50 nanogram, 
So we could still clearly see. At the moment, our champion record is only five, five nanogram. But still, still, we can see the X-ray structure. So, uh, yeah. So only nanogram is. Yeah, we can reduce further, furthermore. But if you have many very critical samples, <laughs> then if we go to the synchrotron facility, maybe a picogram scale or X-ray crystallography is possible. So uh, nobody, probably nobody, or almost nobody had thought about the uh, X-ray crystallography uh, has the, such a high sensitivity or we can analyze the X-ray structure on a nanogram scale. Why? Because we need more samples to make single crystals. So with only nanogram quantity of samples, we cannot make uh, single crystals. But by removing the crystallization protocol, then the X-ray crystallography turned into a, almost a new analysis method that can analyze the structure of target compound on a nano to microgram scale without crystallization. So then uh, we had an idea to combine the X-ray crystallography by gas chromatography purification and also HPLC purification. So, by the uh, preparative, by combining with a preparative gas chromatography, then uh, all the flavor components involved in the peppermint oil were determined. So, the, in all, uh, each peaks were isolated in microgram quantities by the uh, preparative GC separation. And uh, here, a beer company, so Japanese beer company, uh, analyzed the old bitter taste components involved in the hop, beer hop, so and analyzed the most of the major uh, peaks, the structures of the major peaks. Now they can blend, so they can uh, control the taste of uh, beers. Okay, so. If you, uh, we can analyze the profile of your favorite beers, and then we can <laughs> analyze. Uh, actually, uh, they found the uh, active species, so biologically active species, and uh, uh, that they commercialized the uh, healthy beer. So it's now in a supermarket in Japan. So. And uh, uh, regarding the structure analysis of trace amount of compound, so the uh, natural product people always have critical problems. So, and uh, we uh, have worked, uh, we analyzed many, many structure of natural products. So here, uh, this is a repeat compound having five chiral centers. Uh, it never crystallizes, but and the uh, framework is very flexible, so no way to analyze the structure. But uh, we were able to analyze, determining the five chiral centers. And uh, uh, only in two years, uh, we have analyzed more than 70 natural products which we received the natural product chemist uh, from uh, domestic and uh, foreign countries. So we ju just I'm displaying the almost the 70 compounds that we determined, including the absolute configurations. So probably uh, we are one of the most uh, productive so research group among the, all the natural product chemists. Uh, regarding the structure analysis. And uh, we also realized roughly 5% of NMR structures were wrong, so incorrect. So we determined. It doesn't mean that 
5% uh, of natural product chemists are, chemists are very, very poor. It doesn't mean. So uh, this is the limitation of the spectroscopic analysis of natural products. So in the future, uh, we hope that the sponge method is uh, recognized as a standard method to determine the structure of natural products. Of course, X-ray is not always perfect, so we should so study both. So most reliable enamel structure plus most reliable X-ray structure will give you the most convincing analysis method for very, very complex natural product structures. So, and uh, uh, X-ray, uh, this is the uh, so workflow, typical workflow in natural product studies. Uh, actually, starting from the collection of bulk materials, it takes a long way. So we can help uh, only at the so latest step. Okay? Then uh, we applied the method at the very early stage. So we wanted to go to the uh, ocean, but uh, they say it's too dangerous. So then uh, anyway, so uh, we, uh, th this is a bulk of the crude extract okay, obtained from the uh, Laurentia Pacifica. Okay? And this is a collaboration uh, with Professor Jim Kevin at MIT. So uh, that we received uh, only 10 milligram because this is enough so for analyzing everything. So we need only, we can do it. We can analyze only in the microgram quantities. Normally, you have to collect kilogram scale bulk materials to get the one gram quantity of uh, crude extract. Otherwise, during the separation and purification, you will lose everything. So you cannot reach to the structure. But 10 milligram is enough. That means we can reduce at least the two orders of magnitude, so all the experimental protocols. So you're getting the roughly 10 gram of bulk material is enough to start the natural product studies. And uh, uh, in this experiment, the crude mixture, crude mixture was absorbed into the crystalline sponge. So uh, in the crystal, mixture is absorbed. And we re-extracted the absorbed species from the crystal. So namely that we got the two HPLC profiles before and after the guest absorption. So uh, let's compare the two profiles. So the, uh, this uh, uh, so spectrum clearly shows that uh, these peaks are good affinities to the cavities. So regarding the uh, DFH, so it shows no affinity to the cavities. Let's forget about these species. But uh, the other uh, components should have strong affinities. Then uh, we uh, isolated these peaks by HPLC, one by one. And so uh, we uh, analyzed all the compounds only in a few months. Normally it takes a few years. Okay? You can get one PhD. But we did uh, only in a few months. I said to my students, so you, it doesn't mean so you can get PhD in a few months. Okay? <laughs> so, and uh, this is a very modern uh, technique in uh, biology field. Now they can get a new natural product, not from the ocean, not from the forest, but from uh, so DNA information, so from gene, genetic, so genome information. Okay? So from the data bank, now you can easily analyze. So you can do the data mining. Okay? 
And uh, based on the similarity of the sequence, then uh, you can easily specify so the enzymes are here and here and here. So if you want to find the new uh, terpene cyclase, cyclase, then uh, you can easily find such uh, so sequences. Then, uh, so they are, most of them are, so uh, some are working, but uh, many of them are not working, or working at a very, very low level, which we could not detect. So such a sleeping so enzyme uh, is enforced to express by the, uh, the practical biological ways. And that they produce something. So, but uh, by this method, uh, they can obtain a very, very trace amount of the natural, new natural products. So there is a very severe uh, traffic jam at the latest stage. So this is uh, obviously the late, late, uh, limiting step of this field. We have the uh, super uh, motorway, highway. So then uh, uh, we can rapidly go through the, uh, all the protocols. So actually, we had a very nice cooperation with Jin Wen and uh, Professor uh, Abe at the University of Tokyo. And uh, uh, these natural products are found through the uh, data mining of genome sequences. So this field, the studies in this field has been accelerated, so 10 times by 10 times or 100 times. This is not, uh, not the, our expectation, but, but uh, our experience. So we could surely accelerate it, accelerate uh, this field so one or two orders by one or two orders. So uh, I hope the crystalline sponge method uh, will be the game changer in uh, many, many life science researches, as long as molecules are concerned. Let me also discuss the uh, center project, centered project. It, uh, uh, this project is quite simple. We are just simply making the structures bigger and bigger and bigger. So in 2004, uh, we synthesized, we synthesized the M12 L24 molecular sphere, so which I displayed by animation at the beginning of my talk. So it assembles from uh, 12 metals and 24 bridging ligand. Its shape is roughly spherical, roughly spherical, uh, but. Uh, Actually, it has the symmetry of cube octahedron with 12 vertices and 24 sides. So, cube octahedron is one of the uh, 13 Archimedean solids. So, the platonic solids are the regular polygons, so tetrahedron, the cubic, and octahedron. And uh, the uh, Archimedean Solid is a highly symmetric semi regular convex polyhedron composed of two or more types of regular polygons, namely uh, from triangle and square or triangle and pentagon, like this way. And uh, so four of them are tetravalent. So tetravalent means four edges meet at every vortex. So we are using the square planar transition metals. So the, in principle, uh, we can induce the self-assembly of four Archimedean solids. So we targeted the five structures, including the uh, tetravalent platonic solid or octahedron. So, and uh, uh, we realized that uh, we can figure out only five structures, only five possibilities. We thought matter, so possibilities should be 
uh, much, much larger, but only five. So namely, so in this self-assembly, there are magic numbers. And uh, due to the restriction of the space, three-dimensional space, uh, only five structures are allowed. So there is a mathematical constraint in this self-assembly. So we envisioned synthesizing everything. Actually, so 2010, we got rhombicube octahedron. In 2016, we got M30, L60, Aikoshitodekahedron. So uh, every six years, we could step up. So this year, so <laughs> we have to synthesize the last camp. Okay. So uh, before going to the further discussion, so I should convince you the, the, all the structures by showing the X-ray molecular structures. This is the crystal structure of the M2448 sphere. So this siphon core ligand, bridging ligand, worked quite well. You can see, you can count 24 metal centers and 48 bridging ligands. Honestly, I have never counted. You can see the, so this square window is, and this square window is not, not, not equivalent. And uh, there are two uh, circumstances. And uh, by NMR, we could see two sets of ligands by NMR in solution. That means the framework is also very stable even in solution. This is the crystal structure of the uh, M30 L60 Aikoshito decahedron. You can recognize triangle and the pentagon, and triangle and the pentagon. So the molecular weight is over 37,000. This is a chemical formula. But uh, still, there is no errors in the size, shape, and molecular weight, and the chemical formula. So this is a molecule, not a polymer. So without no distribution. So dispersion of structure means dispersion of properties. So we are aiming at the non-dispersed properties from the well-defined discrete structure. The size is close to the 10 nanometer almost comparable to the protein, protein size. Later, I will discuss the protein encapsulation in the case. So this slide shows you how we expanded the cavity and the number of components. So from the furin quadrant, we got uh, so M12, L24. But from the siphon quad, ligand, we got the 24. So the difference is the bond length. And the shear bond is slightly larger, making the, uh, this bend angle a bit larger. So now we are, you can understand that smaller angle prefers smaller framework. And the larger bend angle prefers larger structures. So you can understand why this structure switched between these two regions. So having these two structures, we wondered what happens in between. So we are synthetic chemists, so uh, several new ligands were synthesized. Whose bend angle just divide these two angles with almost the same interval. So what happens? So we could see, we may see the new structures well, we may see a mixture of two structures. Results are very, very impressive. So, okay, uh, let's see. This is the uh, uh, dozy NMR spectrum. So, by which uh, we can analyze the diffusion coefficient, diffusion co coefficient. 
and the smaller structure diffuse rapidly, larger structure component diffuse slowly. And uh, from the difference of the uh, diffusion coefficient, we can roughly estimate the size of the molecule. So we have many, many good uh, standard references. So uh, from these ligands, we observed their formation of one, only one species, which can be uh, assigned to be the M24L48 uh, rhombicube octahedron. No smaller components. And in all cases, you can see two sets of ligands. This is also consistent with the Aikoshito decahedron. Ah, oh, no, 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 rhombicube octahedron framework. But when uh, the angle so becomes uh, 131, then the structure suddenly switched from 24 to 12. And we could see only one set of ligand. Uh, this is consistent with the symmetry of cube octahedron. The structure suddenly switch, namely uh, we could see the threshold. So, uh, so the a sharp threshold exists at around 131 and 34. So it's a kind of phase transition. We are very surprised to this result. Then we realize that even if the uh, initial difference is very, very small, such a small difference will be amplified uh, during the uh, self-assembly from a large number of components. And uh, if they are given conditions or uh, given system slightly prefers the smaller structures, then everybody come to the smaller structure. And if the system slightly prefers bigger structures, then everybody come here. Always small or large because of the amplification effect. In other words, we were unable to make a mixture. So back to this graph. Uh, this axis means the self-assembly uh, parameters, parameters, mainly the uh, bend angle of the ligand. We can make the analog change analog change in, in the self-assembly parameters. But the output is digital. Only five structures are allowed. So, and this analog-digital relationship is very important so, to make the framework stable and to make the uh, formation the highly selective I mean, I mean that uh, at a certain range of self-assembly parameters, we can always reach only one particular structure. And uh, once the framework is formed, uh, this framework is very stable at a certain range of external stimuli. So, selectivity is the most important issue in chemistry. Normally, we control the selectivity by uh, static effects or electronic effects. But the selective formation of this framework is not controlled by the static nor electronic effect, but controlled by the mathematical restriction. We can say that this is the uh, mathematical control of the structure of matter on the nanoscale. We expanded the ca cavity, uh, bent angle, okay, further. Then uh, again, the difference is uh, very small, but uh, it, this difference will be amplified. And in fact, uh, my colleague got something big, <laughs> okay. But, but unfortunately, NMR signals are so broad, and uh, mass spectrometry couldn't show the molecular weight. So we had to get the single crystals, 
And we tried, tried, tried. And uh, uh, finally, we got single crystal, and we did the X-ray analysis. Then uh, after obtaining the crude X-ray structure, we had a totally unexpected situation. So what we obtained was the unexpected M30 L60. Uh, six polyhedron appeared on the stage. Let's see the uh, crude X-ray structure. Just electron density is displayed. So uh, you can see the triangle and the square, triangle and square windows. It's highly symmetric, and the shape is almost roughly a sphere. But it doesn't uh, belong to the Archimedean solids. Even more, we could not find this network topology in any textbooks of geometry. Nobody had discussed this framework. What? What is, what is this guy? We, we're really frustrated. So uh, actually, uh, for a couple of months, uh, we were unable to publish this work. We have the materials. We have the X-ray structure. But uh, we couldn't publish because uh, we cannot explain <laughs> what is this guy. So uh, I have the... Uh, talented young Greek, so another Fujita in my group, so, but he uh, used to be an uh, assistant professor in my group. And uh, finally, he succeeded in making a new mathematical discussion that clearly explained the formation of the uh, unexpected M30 L60. So we were inspired by the Goldberg polyhedral. Goldberg polyhedral, uh, uh, the convex polyhedral, made from only hexagons and pentagons, like this way. And uh, uh, we can consider many. And uh, uh, so every Goldberg can be defined by the relative positions of adjacent pentagons with two indexes, H and K. So from here, you can cross the borders, the three steps and the two steps in, direction, in these directions. So this is Goldberg 3, 2, polyhedral. So like this way, you can define many different Goldberg polyhedral. The Fullerene is one of the Goldberg. So from Pentagon to Pentagon, uh, you can work one step and one step. So this is Goldberg, one, one polyhedron. This bias captured has the uh, Goldberg one, two uh, symmetry. So it, this is a Goldberg one, two structure. Okay. So, and uh, this is uh, our own mathematical discussion. So this is our mathematical discussion. The uh, Goldberg polyhedra has have Trivalent structures in which three edges meet at every vertex. We simply extend the gold bug from the trivalent to the tetravalent structure in which four edges meet at every vertex. And we termed the extended gold bug polyhedron. So, uh, in the Goldberg trivalent structure, the basic network is just a honeycomb structure. But only from hexagon, 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 you get the infinite sheet structure. Now, you can never cross. But by incorporating the pentagons, you can make the convex surface. And as mentioned, uh, each can be defined by two indexes. And uh, Goldberg defined uh, the conventional T numbers by making the square of the summation of the two vectors, it can be, uh, which can be described as such. Uh, this is uh, high school student mathematics. You should remember, okay? <laughs> okay, you should have learned. Okay. So, and uh, H and K are digit numbers. So if you have a T number, then uh, you can easily 
recalculate, recalculate H and K. Namely, T number is a very convenient one letter description of the two indexes. Okay, uh, in our uh, extended Goldberg polyhedra, the basic network is a grid sheet made of only square, square, square. Again, it's an infinite sheet. So, but by incorporating triangles, then we can make the convex surface. So uh, every extended Goldberg polyhedra can be, again, defined by two indexes, H and K. So by analogy, we define the Q number by making the square of the summation of these two vectors. In this case, uh, we can adopt the Pythagoras equation. And uh, uh, based on the uh, Pythagoras equation, uh, we could generate a series of magic numbers or Q numbers. Okay. So what, what are these Q numbers represent? So every Q number represents one specific relationship of the two adjacent triangles. For example, Q number of two means H and K should be one and one. So the relative position should be uh, one step described as the uh, one step and one step, or uh, one step and one step. So it represents cube octahedron. The next possible Q number is four. H and K should be zero and two. So zero step and two step, zero step and two step. It re represents lone cube octahedron. And then the next possible Q number is five. H and K should be one and two. The so one step and two step. So one step and two step. And that this is a framework which we encountered by chance. Now everything is clear, everything is clear. So uh, what we have synthesized was the uh, uh, extended Goldberg polyhedral, which we defined with a Q number of five. We are very surprised. We believed that we are synthesizing a series of Archimedean solids, but it was not true. What we have synthesized was a series of extended Goldberg polyhedral with a Q number of uh, one to five, without missing any Q value. So, then everything is clear, everything is clear. So, but uh, understanding the structure is not the final goal of chemistry. So we want to create new structures. And uh, the most important feature in this mathematical discussion is that this table clearly predicts the, uh, our next structures. So next to 30 is, should be uh, 48 and the 54 and 60. These future structures were theoretically predicted by our mathematical discussion. So we became very serious. We tried many, many different conditions, the new ligands. Then finally, we got this predicted structure. Again, uh, this is a very crude uh, electron density uh, uh, in the uh, X-ray analysis. But you can see triangle, the square, square, and triangle. So two step and two step. The positions of the metal centers were refined, and we confirmed that uh, it has the topology of M48 L96. So this is the tetravalent uh, extended Goldberg polyhedral, uh, 2 2 polyhedron with a Q number of 8. Through the collaboration with a protein crystallographer, we finally defined all the structures. So the molecular weight is over 47,000. This is, again, very huge, but 
uh, uniform uh, so molecular formula. So uh, this is a Guinness Book structure. So in our uh, here is our new roadmap. So uh, actually, Aikoshito de Kahitorin uh, uh, lies on a different series, a different line. And uh, uh, this is a new uh, family of extended Goldberg polyhedra we defined. Currently, uh, we have the structure from Q number of 1 to 8. So, uh, in our new revised roadmap, uh, we have infinite target structures, so the roadmap is infinite. So, so we are still challenging to synthesizing uh, these new structures. Okay. Can I add five more minutes? It's okay, sorry. Yes. <clears throat> what game shall we play with such a huge structure? We are now trying encapsulating proteins. What can you expect? What can you expect? Actually, we did not have real so good ideas, but uh, we expected something should happen okay, by fully caging the proteins. And actually, uh, we observed uh, remar remarkable findings. We could say that uh, we could make non-degradable enzyme. So uh, protein is in a case, and normally in organic solvents, it's unfolded. But in a case, it doesn't denature. So folding structure is kept. It's remarkably stable. And even at the elevated nature, so low egg doesn't go to the boiled egg. Okay, folding structure is still stable. Proteins are remarkably stabilized. And uh, uh, under forcing conditions, the folding structure was denatured. But when the cage is dipped in uh, water, so the buffered water solution, then the original folding structure was regenerated. So, yeah, actually, so it's true that protein structure is not stable, not very, very, very stable. But uh, so in chemistry, so unstable means the structure is very apt to do um, uh, chemical transformations. So the new bond formation or a new bond, dissoci bond dissociation and completely decompose. But uh, in case of proteins, when the pro uh, there are no chemical change, but only the folding structure is uh, okay, so destroyed, so broken. And uh, uh, hydrophobic residues appears on the surface, then uh, they immediately start to aggregate. Then, uh, uh, so, so they, they are condensed, and finally they precipitate. It's totally irre irreversible way. That's the reason why proteins are so unstable. But initial aggregation is completely forbidden. It's completely inhibited by the case. So even uh, it's partially unfolded, it can immediately go back to the folding structure. So that's the reason why the protein is become very, very stable in a case. So uh, here's one uh, example. So we examined the uh, CLE that can uh, uh, hydrize the uh, esters. Okay. Uh, I'd like to show you the only the uh, experimental results. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I'm not familiar with this device. <laughs> yes. So through the shift-based formation, uh, we can easily anchor 
their protein at their interior of the sphere. And the uh, full characterization has, uh, has been uh, discussed in this paper. And uh, this slide shows so the uh, enzyme activity was assayed by observing the uh, absorption of this uh, hydrolysis product. Okay? So, and uh, this graph simply means there are no change in the uh, activities, enzymatic activities after caging. And uh, in water, in Organic, so in organic conditions, then so uh, the activity of proteins, the CLE, significantly drops. This is quite normal observation. But when uh, it's caged, uh, the original activity remained constant. So as I mentioned, it's stable even in organic solvent. So. Uh, but under, after one day, we observed the same profile, still stable. After two days, yes, still stable. But uh, we noticed their uh, profile is slightly deviated from their ideal Mikhail, Mikhail's maintain plot. So uh, after two days, still it's active, but after 12 days, finally, <laughs> protein becomes tired. And uh, we observed quite unusual sigmoidal curve. So sigmoidal curve. That means the activity is once lost. Okay? Activity is once lost, degraded. But very surprisingly, the activity was regenerated during the assay experiment because the assay conditions is aqueous. Let me, okay, let me make it clear, okay? So first, the active protein, native form. So after casing, it's still active. So after treating in organic solvents, so the uncaged protein becomes degraded but still it's active in the cage. However, under forcing conditions, finally the protein is tired. It's degraded. But it come, came back to the active form by retreating under aqueous buffered conditions. We thought the folding structure is once lost. It's unfolded, but it's refolded into the original protein structure. So we did the uh, HSQC to the NMR analysis. Uh, we can get many, many information. Actually, we uh, do the uh, three-dimensional analysis. But the simplest information is just uh, these uh, spectra are just uh, fingerprints of folding structures, fingerprints. So obviously, the native folding structure was broken. And uh, so biology people say that you are observing the molten globule state. So partially so, uh, unfolded structure. But uh, after treating under aqueous conditions, then the original profile, original fingerprint regenerated. So the shear protein folding structure was regenerated, refolding, refolded. So the uh, refolding of the protein by caging is the uh, function of chaperonin protein. So by protecting, so by the uh, physical separation by the physical separation, so their aggregation is forbidden, then the tired proteins can be active, activated so after taking a rest. So this is a principle of chaperoning protein. So we just realized, materialized, uh, realized the chaperoning-like function with 
our self-assembled cage. Yes, as I mentioned, uh, we established the non-degradable enzyme with a chaperonin cage. So uh, this is the very exciting function of our large cage. OK, let me summarize that slide. Yes, as I mentioned I, at the beginning, we are still developing their chemistry into these three directions. So what the most important uh, scientific significance in our, our research, in our chemistry? Now, traditional, in traditional disciplines, the organic people would like to create new shapes because shape is the most important parameter to show the uh, biological activities. But inorganic people do not care the shapes. So they want to see the new states, so new spin state, new oxidation state, new excited state, like this. So they don't care the shape of chemical structures. So in our coordination self-assembly, uh, we uh, established a new interdiscipline in which inorganic chemistry creates new shapes. OK, let me uh, close my talk by thanking to the, uh, all my former and current key co-workers. They are extremely talented. And uh, thanks to their uh, achievements, so I, I could have such a good moment he here. I really thank to the older people, uh, to my young co-workers. Most of them have already promoted uh, to a better position in other institutes or universities. Quite recently, uh, we moved to a new building. So, and uh, just let me show. So we are very happy that we could enter the, this building with three major instrument companies. Oh, okay. So this device rushed rush me. Okay. So, so, so the major companies uh, joined us in the same laboratory. So students are very happy in a new laboratory. So uh, currently, still, my group is very active with the uh, young staff and students. So, OK, thank you for your kind attention. Um, so I have one question regarding the uh, gas molecule captured in the sponge. So I'm very curious about how, how did you distinguish the uh, uh, structure of the gas molecule from the whole structure? Or in other words, how do you deconvolute the diffraction data of your uh, target molecule from your sponge? No, no. Uh, we, we know the host framework, infinite framework. So we can uh, easily recognize which is the which is the host framework, and uh, which are the new uh, framework of the gas income uh, absorbed gas molecules. And so, the second question was? Oh, yeah. So it's just the, da the data-wise. So, so I think the experimental setup would be just like a traditional diffraction yeah, yeah, setup? Yes, yes, yes. Just an in-house X-ray diffractometer, we could get but uh, the cell constant is very large. And uh, we, uh, the crystallographic refinement is not routine, not routine. So you have to be trained. <coughs> I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I have a question about uh, protein, which okay. is confined into a cage. So can small molecules go through the cage? Sure, sure. The okay. window is very large. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> because more than one nanometer and one nanometer, the small molecule can easily come into the protein. But uh, can I ask you the maximum size of the small compounds which can go through the cage? So window size? Yes, yes. I think 
So yeah, it's more than one nanometer, so more than 10 ohms long. No. So the small, most of the small molecule can easily go. So we might be able to use our enzyme for very yes, long yes, period. Yes. Okay. It does not disturb. Yeah, actually, uh, there are similar experiments with polymer matrix. The protein is wrapped with the proteins, uh, wrapped with polymers, organic polymers. But in this case, uh, the small molecules cannot address, cannot access to the enzyme active centers. Then the uh, uh, enzyme's activity significantly drops. But uh, in so our case, it's just a framework. It doesn't disturb the access of small molecules. Thank you. Palladium requires a square planar geometry. Yeah. Please. What happens if you use metal centers that require octahedral geometry? Ah, yes. Uh, actually, so uh, in principle, we can use many, many different metals with different coordination geometries. But uh, in self assembly, uh, the coordination bond should be not too labile and not too inert. And uh, uh, we examined many, many combinations. And among the, all the combinations, the palladium pyrogen combination is the best. So. Um, what, exactly is, <clears throat> what exactly is it about the cage that causes it to keep the proteins folded for so long? Is it just the size, or does it retain water? Mm, so, uh, yeah, if the uh, dimension of the protein is smaller than the proteins, uh, the smaller than cage, uh, it doesn't need to strictly fit to the cavities. Actually, uh, we have already examined several different pro proteins. Uh, some are very small, so. Uh, it has the uh, large free volume, still free volume in the case. Uh, some are very tightly packed, but uh, in all cases, we observed the stabilization of proteins. Okay, I have a question. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, regarding the second segment in the self-assembly, where you showed the uh, five structures, and you mentioned you've synthesized three of the five and anticipate one this year. Uh, the three that you did already, was that a matter of ease or priority as far as relevance to housing certain target compounds? So yeah, we have, yeah, we synthesized three, and then, so what, please repeat. Uh, the question is, the three that you did, excluding the two that have not yet, Mm. Uh, was that a matter of ease or priority since the, some of them were more relevant for certain uh, target compounds to host? So you mean the uh, last structure? So. Ah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, mathematically, so the uh, Icos dodecahedron lies on a different series. So, we need a different mathematical scheme so to describe. The, These two structures, yes. So, yeah, yeah. Actually, so we have made the uh, also the mathematical description of these two structures, but the uh, equation is a bit complicated, and uh, right now I cannot remember. So, but uh, based uh, along this line, uh, we can think of many new structures. 
Uh, Dr. Fajita, uh, for a crystallographer, uh, the membrane protein crystallization is challenging. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you tried any membrane protein with the uh, we, we want sponge? We want to, yes, it's, it's the, uh, our multi, so ultimate goal. But uh, so unfortunately, the membrane proteins are too large, still too large exactly. to be caged. So in a sphere, so we have to make the sphere much bigger. But uh, yeah, hopefully we can modify, the chemically modify the interior of the sphere, uh, which is very similar to the, uh, uh, the circumstances in the membrane. Okay. Thank you. So. Hi. Thanks for the beautiful uh, sharing the beautiful work. I have two small questions. One was when you are crystallizing the molecules inside the cage, do you see evidence that there's different um, intermolecular interactions that changes the relative geometry of those molecules compared to, say, when they were in uh, neat crystals? Yeah. Uh, yes. The, in the crystal structures, always uh, the molecular structures are somewhat biased through their interactions uh, with the surrounding species. Uh, it's always the uh, problem of X-ray crystallography. So, so for example, then uh, we can discuss the chemical structure, the connectivity, and the configurations. But uh, we never say uh, we can predict the conformation of molecule by the sponge method. So, but uh, but in practice, in practice, in many examples. Uh, we could reproduce the gas phase structure in the cavity. So the gas molecules are soft landed in the pore, and uh, it can reproduce the gas phase um, structures in practice. And a small follow-up question. So I was really interested to see that you, you were working with pharmaceutical companies to come up with the structures of the molecules, and I know that um, in pharmaceuticals, getting the powder diffraction pattern can be uh, what's really important when they're trying to patent new drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and so what does this mean for, for your methodology in terms of finding yeah. the structure? Is this something they can use to then patent a different new drug or confirmation? OK. So first, the, uh, by powder diffractions, so uh, normally so they get their so packing, packing of Gas molecules because uh, depending on the packing, so then the solubility of the compound should significantly change. So unfortunately, the, uh, from the sponge method, uh, we cannot see the gas packing structure because it's not not packed by itself. So. <coughs> Seven years ago, you. <coughs> gave lecture to us. Uh, sponge method has uh, some molecular size limitation. Uh -huh. Yeah. But uh, today you showed about 70 uh, molecules. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, just some, yeah, of course this is uh, not protein, natural product. Therefore, triterpen uh, is a, in our category, triterpen is a large molecule, OK? Uh, but I think you you successfully analyzed the yes, triterpene. Yes, yes, That means, uh, did, did you improve the some sure. sponge? Yeah, uh, actually, so at the early stage of our crystalline sponge studies, mm. so we also believed that there is a size limitation. Mm. Okay, and by X-ray crystallographic analysis, we can estimate, we can roughly uh, so measure the cavity size. Mm. Then uh, we believed that, for example, uh, see the, if somebody failed with C20 compounds, mm -hmm. then the, he says, oh, C20 is the limitation. Mm -hmm. Then uh, nobody would like to try. <laughs> but someday, one day, a beginner comes to the laboratory, mm -hmm. and he just examined C30 and succeeded. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, finally, the, we found that cavity is very, very flexible. And uh, with big gas molecules, cavity can be expanded. 
And uh, uh, right now, uh, the largest molecule contained, uh, which we analyzed, contained uh, C35 or C40. So uh, even we don't know the limitation. <laughs> Um, it's quite, worth trying. Uh, seven years ago, initially, I asked you to uh, try terpen. Uh, 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 try terpen is fine. Yeah, yeah, but uh, at that point, you said you didn't. <laughs> you couldn't. We believe that uh, so it was So I gave uh, some small model compound. And of course, you found uh, mm. new uh, uh, you, you are considering to send me a big molecule, <laughs> bigger molecule. Oh, really? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because uh, CDD, sorry, CDDO with uh, CO, uh, molecular, uh, uh, micro is uh, gives much more impact to our NRF2 Hi. biologist Hi. group, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question at the back. These are very beautiful symmetric structures. Have you considered is there a possibility of breaking the symmetry and creating something that is more cylindrical, perhaps? Yeah. I know that it's not the basic self-assembly mm -hmm. rule you enforce, but... So from a uh, so physical viewpoint, the uh, highly symmetric structure can reduce the uh, surface energy. The surface energy is minimized. So that's the reason why highly symmetric structure is preferred. Question so. in front. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, very exciting talk. Um, you successfully made these cages larger, right? Are you anticipating when you make them even larger that there is defects or intergrowth of these cages? or Defect? Defective structures or if the cages are inter interlinked and interconnected? So uh, by X-ray crystallography, we cannot, we cannot see the defect if, even if there exist defects. But the, uh, so defect structure is much less stable than the complete structure. Maybe an equilibrium shifts so that the complete structure is formed. So. Thank you. So I expect there are even more questions, but maybe we should move out to the reception. Um, so let's thank Dr. Fujita for a fantastic seminar. Thank you very much. And um, before we leave, I'd like to invite Professor Ojima to, um, for a, a presentation. Ah, thank, you very much thank you very much. Beautiful picture. Okay, this is uh, yeah, the inaugural uh, plaque for this award. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, sure. Yeah, you're good. You're good. You're good. Okay, so you hold it, right? Okay. Okay. So maybe. Nicole, maybe you come this side. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Good job. <laughs> Go for okay. it and celebrate. <laughs> okay, thank you very Let's much. Thank you very much. much.